So welcome everyone. Um, let's see, I, unfortunately, who's showing it right now is Diane Trenum. Could you mute yourself? Maybe. <laughs> oh, there's always a few glitches here. Okay, so anyway, I will begin. Um, so welcome everyone to this uh, celebration. And it's so, you know, I'm still so grateful for Zoom <laughs> for all we complain about it. And uh, it has kept us together during this time. And I think that this uh, reading in particular is going to um, take us to many corners of many uh, hearts. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. How we're going to start is uh, Diane and I are going to read it by way of introduction. We're going to read the introduction because the introduction in so many ways describes how this project came to be, how it developed and uh, how we see uh, what you're holding in your hands if you have the book with you right now. So Diane is going to start with the first paragraph of the introduction. And I do want to say that I just loved working on the introduction with Parto. We both wrote parts of it and helped each other fine tune our parts. It, it was a wonderful process. This book is a gathering of community. It chronicles our pandemic times through the eyes, hearts, and minds of poets. Along with the lockdown of many aspects of our society, it has been a time of tremendous social unrest. Everyone had to find their own ways of coping. The pandemic took away many things, a bevy of customary comforts, celebrations and enlivenments, but it also gave. One of its most radical gifts was time. Another, ourselves. Every morning during lockdown, a shiny new satchel of 24 hours was delivered to our doors to be spent for the most part with ourselves. Strange, isn't it? How in our interminable frenzied race, no matter how fast we ran, we were always short on time. And how now suddenly a great majority of us had more than we knew what to do with. A world of time, forgetting to know the one we'd hoped to make a deeper connection with, that quizzical one in the mirror. Not that it was easy, Especially in the beginning, it was incredibly difficult to be stripped of the comforts and challenges of gathering and other delightful and not so delightful distractions. But slowly, many of us began to see this inward turning as precisely what had been missing. As we gave ourselves over to the simplest things, baking bread, cleaning out long neglected drawers, sending off handwritten letters, unearthing those boxes of jigsaw puzzles from the back of the cupboard, the muses in us awakened and began to speak. Between our puzzlings over the jigsawed pieces and the scattered bits of our lives, art arrived. For the poets in this book, the art came flying in the form of new poems. We began to sense that perhaps there had been some curious wisdom in setting up the card table and spilling out the myriad jigsawed contents from the puzzle box. The quest to bring all the pieces into a meaningful whole became a kind of Zen koan, a powerful riddle with the potential of shifting our entire way of seeing. As we worked at them, the puzzles taught us things. When you first look at the scramble of parts spread across the table, all the pieces look pretty much alike, but it turns out that each piece is so utterly unique that there is only one place for it in the entire world of the puzzle. Without it, there is an unhappy gap, a black hole, a picture that is sadly incomplete. The idea for this book began with pandemic puzzle poems. Last spring, Several poets in the Blue Light Press community wrote poems about doing jigsaw puzzles during the lockdown. A favorite by Michelle Demers is in the shape of a jigsaw puzzle. It's the first poem in the book, actually. Um, we thought it would be a great idea to do a chapbook, but as you can see, the book expanded to include all aspects of the pandemic times how we feel during these most unusual times, how we are coping, 
how we are spending our time, what has changed in our lives, and how to stay inspired during the quiet time. When George Floyd was murdered, the scope of the book expanded again. Poets stepped into the role of speaking as the conscience of our society, calling for social justice. We were flooded with poems to grieve George Floyd and others who were harmed, poems about the protests and calls for change. One of the poets in this book lives in Minneapolis, across the alley from the club where George Floyd worked as a security guard. That would be Linda Wing. Another layer of poems came in during the terrible fires in California and the West Coast. We rediscovered, as always, the poems that move us most are the ones that come from deep inside. To complete the book, we asked for positive visions about the future and how we can create it. We also asked for inspiring poems about the joy and mystery of being alive. Poetry reminds us what it means to be human. We hope that some of what you read here will help you find meaning from your own pandemic times. And as things open up again, the reawakening of the world with a new vision of what it means to be human. And I'm going to share a quote from the back cover from Joseph Zaccardi. To write a single poem is a selfless act and a minor miracle. In times of trouble, people often turn to poems and poems often turn into prayers. Mm. Thank you, Diane. Beautiful to share this project with you, really. Uh, she's one of the easiest people in the world to work with. She blesses it with playfulness. <laughs> Everything is relaxed and that was very helpful. So uh, now we will start our reading. And um, I promised our two most luminary poets to open. Uh, and I know that everyone's really looking forward to seeing their faces and hearing them read. And I'm so grateful that they are giving us this time tonight. So uh, our first reader tonight will be Jane Hirschfield. Well, thank you, Parto. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, everybody who contributed to this book and everybody who is celebrating it tonight. Um, I think it's appropriate my poem be early in the reading because it might be the earliest one in the book when it was written. It was written uh, March 17th, uh, 2020 which was the first day of shelter in place in the Bay Area when everything suddenly went very quiet. Today, when I could do nothing. Today, when I could do nothing, I saved an ant. It must have come in with the morning paper still being delivered to those who shelter in place. A morning paper is still an essential service. I am not an essential service. I have coffee and books, time, a garden, silence enough to fill cisterns. It must have first walked the morning paper as if loosened ink taking the shape of an ant, then across the laptop computer, warm, then onto the back of a cushion. Small black ant alone, crossing a navy cushion, moving steadily because that is what it could do. Set outside in the sun, it could not have found again its nest. What then did I save? It did not look as if it was frightened, even while walking my hand, which moved it through stillness and air. Ant alone, without companion, whose ant heart I could not fathom. How is your life? I wanted to ask. I lifted it, took it outside. This first day when I could do nothing, contribute nothing beyond staying distant from my own kind, I did this. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. I feel we are very blessed to have you. And to have that as the opening poem is just perfect. And our next reader, who is a maker of puzzles, is Dorian Lux. 
and she is also gracing us with the celebration and um, is going to read two poems, I believe. Dorianne. Yeah, I don't need a pandemic to do a puzzle, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, this was written a very long time ago, one of my first or second books, and it's called Break. We put the puzzle together piece by piece, loving how one curved notch fits so sweetly with another. A yellow smudge becomes the brush of a broom, and two blue arms fill in the last of the sky. We patch together porch swings and autumn trees, matching gold to gold. We hold the eyes of deer in our palms, a pair of brown shoes. We do this as the child circles her room, impatient with her blossoming, tired of the neat house, the made bed, the good food. We let her brood as we shuffle through the pieces, setting each one into place with a satisfied tap, our backs turned for a few hours to a world that is crumbling, a sky that is falling, the pieces we are required to return to. Mm. And this poem comes from a new chapbook I have out um, called Salt. And it was made by my um, booking agent, Von Felder, at the field office agency. And it was uh, hand bound on the banks of Lake Cumberland during the pandemic 2020. And this poem is called, In Any Event. If we are fractured, we are fractured like stars, bred to shine in every direction, through any dimension, billions of years, since and hence. I shall not lament the human, not yet. There is something more to come, our hearts a gold mine, not yet plumbed an uncharted sea. Nothing is gone forever. If we came from dust and will return to dust, then we can find our way into anything. What we are capable of is not yet known. And I praise us now in advance. Hmm. That was a blessing on us all, thank you. Thank you so much. So our next readers will be um, in alphabetical order as the book is organized, so, uh, so that you know where you are. And I know that some people um, thought about pages. For me, you'll have to decide on this. If you have the book in your hand, maybe you want to look people up. I prefer to just uh, listen. So that's how I'm going to do it. <laughs> so our first reader then of the, uh, from those pages is Ellery Akers. I'm going to read a poem called Washing. We are washing our hands in front of a stone spigot, a faucet, a tin basin, a bucket, a sink, with soap, with a washcloth, with a rag, we are opening up the lattices of our fingers. We are washing our knuckles, our wrists. We are turning our hands over so we can see our palms, the creases, the line that a palmist would say is the fate line, the health line, the heart line, the life line, that curls under the ball of the thumb, the marriage line, a crinkle to one side. Lines formed when we were in our mother's belly. We are lathering, we are swabbing, we are wiping, we are hoping, we are scrubbing away that tiny sphere with its spicules. We are singing happy birthday or God save the queen. We are looking for bubbles. We are looking for foam. We are looking under our fingernails. We are drawing the sack 
of loneliness over our heads, trying to breathe inside its coarse hood. And our hands look wrinkled and drained from being washed so often. We are rubbing our palms together the way villains rub their hands together in a movie to signify they're going to get more money. <laughs> mm, I love the places we're visiting. <laughs> All so familiar. Thank you, Ellery. Beautiful. Our next reading is reader is Calvin Algren. Calvin? Yes. Oh, there you are. I was unmuting. Oh, good. I'm going to read a poem called On the Rise. It's just a flight of cream colored roses that seems to cup the last of daylight to charm and soothe this little house while twilight gradually anchors trees and shrubbery all around, but it feels like more. Down at the street, runners pass the gates into the cemetery's dead end turnaround. None of them dressed for an occasion, just a summer trot by in shorts and tank tops, and all of them unreckoning in a plane of possible contagion. Walkers and cyclists too eat up the asphalt in rhythmic procession. Mostly they are masked against infection by the virus, by the century, by squabbling in the capital, the wholesale loss of civility and comity and compassion. The barefaced hold their breath, pull up the strained necks of their tees, defer to hope and longing. Worldwide, how many succumbed to the virus today? Everywhere, the numbers catching fire. Seen from this remove, my domestic haven, the roses seem to fly at sundown as a dancer alone on stage, might toy with gravity under the outpouring of love's unstated presence. Mm. Thank you, Calvin. Mm. Our next reader is Kitty Baker. Hello. I have spent my pandemic days hoping will come out of it changed and wiser with new habits that nurture and conserve every precious morsel of what nature so freely gives us. This poem's title serves also as its opening line. What would I give to say I gave it my all? Did I ever? Was I mostly just minding my itsy bitsy business when I could have been planting sage for honeybees, native fire defiant trees, gardening all the goods I'd ever need. What would I give to say I had no part in it when I gaze back someday, see the blue glow of my planet gone, ash gray. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Our next reader is Anna Burnett. Inside. Inside tawny dunes, pale yellow green clumps of green of grass dance with the fierce ocean wind. Snowy plovers group and fly above the water, round back and hop on one foot searching for tiny crabs in the wet sand. Above us, stars squiggle and bend like heat waves on blacktop. Sometimes the stars are inside us. 
I see their light shining from every cell of our bodies. This light that grants wishes for free. These days behind our masks, beneath these orbs sprinkled through icy space, we look out and wave. We hear the children's muffled laughter through fabric that cannot block the stars that shine out from each. Since the folding in of winter, the potatoes have grown more than eyes and the pomegranates have burst on the small tree that grows next to the scarlet runner beans, dry as the white whale skull that beckoned us. Come, touch and pray, give thanks. Deep longing returns the birds' calls of laughter on the play structure. Joyful vibrations from the children lighten broken hearts with hope and healing. And the beans hang on the trellis, crackled. They remind me of the whale bones and maybe we could plant them and what would they grow? How many sweet red seeds would it take to measure the stars? How many purple spotted beans would have to grow to reach heaven? How many people will you recognize by their eyes? And how will you know you're in the universe where you belong? Will you know the light? Will you reach for her and hold her hand? Thank you so much, Anna. <laughs> Beautiful reading. Our next reader is Mary Cavanero. I wanna thank Parto and Diane. I just have to thank you so much for this reading. And the poem I'm gonna read is called The Pandemic Wander. Inside me is a long lean body. Inside me is a doughy round woman. Near and around me, every thought I've ever had. Lately, I watch baking shows over and over, the same bakes by the same British bakers. They want to win ferociously, yet they are kind to one another over and over again. Walking, I think it's no joke, we really do die. I keep learning it over and over, falling back into wishful naivete again and again. The world is good, people are kind, and everything will be all right. But then I see not all will be right. Some will be terribly wrong, and some will say it is what it is. We exist in a terrible mystery, a terrible lie. After walking 10,000 steps over and over, following the curved route up the staircase hidden between houses, next the steep streets with no sidewalks, and finally straight down the hill to home. I hear someone's wind chimes just as I glance at some bluebells. And of course, it seems the flowers are ringing. Almost home and I think, these are the fairy tales we feel even now when we know it is the time of the big bad wolf or worse. Mm. Thank you, Mary. Our next reader is Kat Crawford. Thank you, Parto and Diane. Thank you for this wonderful anthology. I'm reminded of the joy of what Diane, um, Diane said about the joy and mystery of being alive, uh, which was probably what inspired me to write this poem about the joys and mysteries of technology and and of life it's called ode to my smartphone whole cities inside you complete with sparks descending from fireworks stories of migrants trapped children starvation gorillas and leopards swing leap rearing their proud heads an elephant rider a rodeo cowboy are all there. You light up your screen. Tell me of families jobless and their gardens still grow. Children show us and the writers write in the times and the post make strange sense of insanity. 
I ask you questions about chicken and rice. How long? How much? What is the distance? You keep up in a tart British accent. I don't respond to anger. When my rant hurled, hurtled out, you scolded. Don't connect. Bad zone, bad phone. I have not learned to train you. I say the names of the dead on your to-do list. You answer, they are not in your contacts. Teach me to say, dance with me in Italian. A zillion shops lure us in day and night. Friends, unfriends, meditators sit with me around the world, Norway, Africa, Belize, in my bedroom, all close their eyes. You pray and ring bells. Thank you, Kat, for being part of this and bringing that beautiful poem. Our next reader is Diana Donovan. I'm reading a poem called Wish. Ella was a good natured child who asked for very little. So when she begged me to take her to a wishing well, I waited until the rain had passed, then drove to a shopping mall. It was a fancy one. There was a Saks Fifth Avenue and a Barnes and Noble. And next to Sephora stood an ornate fountain, an elephant on a circus ball its trunk spouting water into the air with joy. Holding onto her stuffed rabbit in one hand, Ella stood beside me and I placed a penny in her other hand, small and warm. She drew a breath, squeezed her eyes shut and threw the coin in. Narrow rays of sunshine pierced the clouds above us. The elephant perched motionless, a fine mist sprang about it. Ella broke the silence, her lip quivering. It didn't work, mama. I took her hand. I'm sorry, bug, I said, and we walked back to the car, our boots splashing through the puddles on the sidewalk. I prayed for a rainbow to appear, a sign of wonder. I didn't want to think about Santa Claus or the tooth fairy or how Ella might never have a sister or a brother. I couldn't bear empty promises, magic disappearing from her world. Some wishes take time, I said. We mustn't lose hope. And as the words left my mouth, I knew that I would never stop believing in miracles. And she, my daughter, was living proof. Thank you so much, Diana. Our next reader is Linda Enders. Hello, everyone. I'm going to read my poem with a very long title. Here goes. Reasons to welcome autumn 2020 to California in spite of politics and the pandemic. Because a fiery summer full of chaos and fury has come to an end. Because it's not yet winter. Because of deep purple, dark red, every shade of orange and tawny gold. Because the leaves transform from glory to glory and the trees let them go because like the trees, you have much to let go. Because you can count on the neighbor to complain again that autumn blows all the leaves from the liquid amber trees up and down our street into her yard. Because the blackberries, pears, pomegranates, pumpkins, 
and steamy mugs of tea. Because it's Halloween and the mask and the macabre are welcomed by all. Because it's a somber season populated by superheroes, skeletons and ghosts. Because the time has come to light candles against the gathering dark. Thank you for that candle, <laughs> Linda. Our next reader is Catlin Fendler. Thank you everyone for this wonderful anthology. What started for me as a ordinary chore turned into a ritual and a relationship and a teaching. My poem is called Garden Sutra. Each morning I bathe Buddha and I swear he smiles. Sitting there in the garden, still as only sculpted stone can be, chin down, fingers curved, meeting in a mudra like links in a chain, eyes closed to daylight, sharp wind, bitter rain, dew clinging to his eyelashes through the chill of night after night. Even so, when I go to fill the basin of the waterfall beside him, each morning I bathe Buddha and I swear he smiles. It seems petals fall one by one from every dream. No matter how I tend it, they fall. It's a jungle in this garden. Everything's got teeth. Even stars eat each other when two galaxies draw near. I've lost my heart, my hope. The figs and the roses fail. The dogs get skunked. The Big Dipper tilts empty. The moon turns her face away. But each morning I bathe Buddha and I swear he smiles. Mm, thank you so much, Catelyn, beautiful. Our next reader is Marilyn Gaines. My poem is called Essential. His name, one of those monosyllabic manly names, Bob or Kurt or Frank. I asked once when I caught up to his mail truck. His smile, a bulging manila envelope of good cheer, determination, irony, maybe a secret. He used to stop along the route to schmooze with a guy or two, but these days he just keeps going. I'm disguised crown to chin by a floppy hat, sunglasses, mask, but recognized by the psychedelic cane I carry like Dumbo's feather. <clears throat> he no longer sees my smile, but he hears me scream, thank you, as he careens around the corner and we salute one another with thumbs up, each thumb an Olympic torch of praise and celebration. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for that moment. Our next reader is Jackie Kudler. Hi, thank you everyone for this wonderful reading. Pandemic day two. 9 a.m. daily run past the Sausalito Ferry. Two cars crouched in a lot where 200 slumbered yesterday. Past the closed front doors of the fudge shop, the no-name bar, Two Bella Boutique. Mannequins in the window flashing me glassy smile. Past three masked walkers six feet apart on the long promenade just above the bay. The front door of my life locked too, shut down for a duration of indeterminate end. My life, the hugs, the loving hands, oh, the loving hands, the classes, the agendas, the lingering lunches, the monthly meetings, the movies, the ballet, oh, the ballet, mm -hmm. cruising aisles at soft Safeway, 
cruising air currents out of SFO, all shut down now. And apart from the daily anxiety prods, USA deaths top 2100. Oh, those were the days, date two. Fauer, uh, Fauci predicts 200,000. Why doesn't Mike answer his phone? Can I touch my newspapers? Can I touch my mail? Still, still, nothing I have to do, nowhere I have to be. Time, my tireless driver, stretched out snoozing in the back seat. And I, a child again, homesick from school, the day unfolding before me, long and lazy as a cat. Some snacks to keep me happy, sufficient storybooks at my side to ease me right on through to next year. A new life, yes, provided I survive. And one I could get used to very, very fast. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Wonderful journey. Our next reader is Jeremy Littman. Wind songs. Wind is a separate story. Each crisp ponderosa pine, elder musing cedars, capricious willow flocks, starlit stones, shadowed creeks appear as letters, thoughts, whispered dreams from tall grass prairies, weave to stanzas of belonging to everything she touches, captures my chilled feet and chafed heels in wolf's creeks, wondrous waters. Thank you so much, Jeremy for a little breeze in our reading. <laughs> our next reader is Stephanie Noble. Thank you, Parto, and thank you, Diana. Thank you, everyone, for this wonderful book. So the poem I'm sharing is, um, it captures two contrasting events that was a, were able to catch our attention only because so many during the lockdown did have time to pause, slow down and notice. And we all need to understand that this pairing is not unique, but a pattern that has continued for centuries. My poem's called, Now You Know. May 25th, 2020, George Floyd, an unarmed black man, gets an instant death sentence by an officer's knee on his neck. May 26, 2020, Peter Manfredonia, a white man on a killing spree, gets a televised, televised heartfelt plea from a state police officer. We know this is not who you are. Come home and you'll be treated fairly. It's all there in black and white. Once you know, you can't unknow. Now you know. Thank you so much for adding that to our book, Stephanie. So much. Our next reader is Barbara Quick. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. This is called In the Before Times. In the Before Times, we took dance classes, not online, but body to body in a room with a sprung wooden floor, unmasked, barefoot and scantily clad in lycra. We greeted each other with hugs, big hugs. We embraced the drummers too, if we knew them, and flashed our unprotected smiles when the choreography sent us flying past them. I know it's hard to understand now, but we didn't worry about rogue droplets of sweat or aerosolized breath that might worm their way in and consign us to horrible illness or death. We thought 
only of the wild joy of dancing. Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Barbara. I love the different dips and, and leaps we are taking together tonight. Frankie Soto is our next reader. Hey, I'm super, super thankful to be here with everyone and be part of this magical anthology. And uh, I love being able to just listen. I wanted to write so much in the chat, but saying things every time I write, so I was like, let me just wait. Uh, this poem is in my manuscript, Petrichor. Um, it's also obviously an anthology, which is just such a blessing. And it's called Surrender. And it's about the relationship with me and my son. Surrender. I cradle my head into the smallest of arms. One eighth my size and still I melt like butter on a morning pan. Digging into my hair, his fingers exploring each strand. Like a treasure, each sound I make, his heartbeat jumps a little bit quicker. Here I surrender, a piece of driftwood on a river, a distant nursery rhyme shouts in the bedroom, another toy I forgot to shut off. He rubs my head as if I was a genie in a lamp and he asks for nothing in return other than this time together. Thank mm. you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was beautiful, Frankie. Our next reader is Steve Trenum. Thank you, Pardo and Diane. Um, I usually write my poems in the morning while I'm still in bed with my clipboard propped up on my white fur ball of a cat. But this poem was written in its entirety while I was doing a slow motion mambo around my living room. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. It is called Let's After Parto Sereno. Let's hang sheets of rain on a clothesline. Dangle lavender bundles from curtain rods. Carry bars of soap in our pockets to scrub the stricken air. Let us pull up weeds and plant them in places they won't recognize. Bring hummingbirds inside to hover, hover in our living rooms. Let beetles burrow through memories to get to the bottom of things. Our minds are too much on hold. Let's free them to slip by that ominous cloud and patchwork a quilt of front porch stories that make no sense to the fearful heart. Thank you. Back to Prato. Thank, thank you, Steve. Wonderful. Our next reading is Lynn, late reader is Lynn Unger. This poem is called These Days. Anyone who tells you not to be afraid should have their head examined. Cities are burning, hillsides are burning, and the dumpster fire of our common life is out of control. I wish I could tell you when it was going to get better. I wish I could promise that better was anywhere down the road. I miss dancing, bodies in something between conversation and flight. I miss singing the way we trusted the air that moved between us. I miss the casual assumption that everything would be all right in the morning. These days I'm trying to be buoyed by the smallest things, a ripe tomato, a smattering of rain. These days I am trying to remember that songs of lamentation are still songs. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Lynn. And our next reader is Loretta Diane Walker. Thank you, Pratt, and thank you, Diane. And I am so honored to be a part of this anthology. 
Um, in 2019, I, I live in Odessa, Texas. In 2019, we had a mass shooting and it happened um, less than a mile from where I live. Um, it started in this area. One of my former students um, was, was murdered. Seven people were murdered. Um, the parent of one of my students was shot. Two of my students actually, they were eight years old at the time. They witnessed the murder um, of, of the postal worker. And I was thinking about their trauma and the trauma of the city. There were several people on our campus and I was thinking about that. And then I thought about those kids because I teach elementary music, them healing. And then I thought about the trauma of watching George Floyd being murdered. I think most of the world, unfortunately not all, but most of the world, I think we were traumatized to actually see this. And I remember seeing faces of some of the children. Uh, but I, I thought about that, but this poem is entitled, again, last night's food riots in my stomach as I watch millions of eyes watch a black man's life end in the street. The weight of a knee on his neck for eight minutes. The blue pressing his knee listens, hands in his pockets to the bound man cry for his mother. His mother's grave cries. His brother pleads, my family wants peace. After his lifted knee, did the officer go home, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, kiss his wife, wash guilt from his hand? Pain, that strong current rips through the world, its waves crushing as massive stones. Descendants, None descendants of slaves or feathers on injustice's cruel bird. Unrest dirties the night with orange flames. Anger mumbles through the crowds, mixed with mourners in mutineers. Why does innocence draw disgrace? Can spirits rust? Who can place a curfew on despair? What saw can slice a wall of indifference? A trio of blues refuses to serve and protect another black man. Their silence is death. Thank you. Mm. So powerful. Thank you, Loretta, for being here with us in that poem. Our next reader is uh, Diane Frank. She, my co-editor, <laughs> my co-instigator, <laughs> Diane Frank. And I do, I do want to thank everyone in this book, whether you're reading tonight or will be reading in the future. Uh, Loretta, your poem is just so powerful. I have tears in my eyes every time I hear you read it. And now to follow you, well, that's hard. My poem is Turtle Island. I felt that um, along with all the difficult times, we need poems that will um, provide joy, provide vision that will create the future. So um, Turtle Island. What if the world was created by a giant turtle swimming across the sky at the beginning of time? What if the turtle carried dreams in her belly, giving birth to fish and stars? What if the high flying turn marked the world lines of space and time with nets of aurora borealis? What if the donkey said, the humans are a joke, spinning through space, juggling fire and ice? What if the crab said, crawl sideways if you want to uncover 
the dreams that are painted inside of shells. What if the moon said, the night will tell you secrets if you listen to the music inside of stones? What if the shark said, you will discover fish that glow like lanterns in deeper currents of ocean water? What if the octopus said, your dreams are tentacles into a future filled with fish and golden apples? What if the turtle keeps swimming out of the sky to a universe hidden somewhere else? What if the buffaloes stampede with their ancestors across the Great Plains under an ocean of sky? Buffalo woman says, the world is a dream or nightmare. Weave your visions with tender hands. Thank you, Diane, beautiful. And um, I'm going to read one of my poems. This is the last poem that we, that is part of the reading. And uh, I'm going to end with um, this poem, How to Befriend Uncertainty. And it's interesting to me because I was teaching on Zoom. I was a poet in the schools really almost full time at that point. And uh, I was teaching sixth grade. And it was trying, it was last spring, and it was trying to, uh, help them find inside themselves uh, some instructions that might be useful, their own wise uh, person inside. And so uh, I wrote one myself. I, I needed to give them a sample. And I sat there and I thought, well, what do I need instructions about? It was an instruction poem assignment. And I decided mm, uncertainty, uncertainty. <laughs> so how to befriend uncertainty. Come sit in the seat by the window, near the birds who have shaken off their dreams and opened themselves to this never-to-be-again day. Today we won't be asked to bumble along the beaten byways, for uncertainty is our house guest. Put on the water, set out the homemade jam. Uncertainty will listen with us as our bagels pop from the toaster's dark mouth and the coffee grounds weep their bittersweet sobs. Uncertainty is mystery's love child. No history, no proper name, but she has always been with us. She is the one who wakes us to drizzle new questions into our day, new stories, new colors and light. The wind is her breath. Her body is the water we bathe in and drink. Uncertainty with her barefoot dancing gypsy soul knows the unpaved roads to gratitude by heart. But of certain things, like tomorrow, she knows nothing. And because of this, her love knows no bounds. So, <laughs> thank you, everyone. This was such a wonderful... Uh, I've seen lots of, uh, of beautiful comments coming in and it was just such a wonderful gathering and to touch all these different places in our shared geography of hope and, and all the things in, in despair and all the things in between. <laughs> so um, the poems did it better than I can do right now. <laughs> uh, Diane, what, do, would you like to offer, you said maybe, comments? I'm not sure how to orchestrate that, though. Um, well, the reading right now is officially over. If anyone wants to say anything or, you know, it's the we're going to open the floor, but please one person at a time, if you could just stay muted until you want to talk. We're just a little bit of social time right now, which is what we'd be doing at a poetry reading if we were all in the same room or in the chat, whatever you want. But um, on behalf of Parto and myself, I just want to express my gratitude to everyone who came to hear us 
tonight and again to all of the poets in the book. It was just such a wonderful process of gathering the poems and a pure delight working with Prato because we, you know, she, we live in different places. We're close, but um, we have different communities. And for me, poetry is very much about community. So we blended our community, we blended our friends and the result was this book. Yes. <laughs> New friends for everyone here, yeah. Great. Uh, I just wanna say thank you again. Uh, thank you to Diane too for stopping me with this poem because I was gonna just share it and she, she found it and she was like, you have to have this in this project that I'm working on and to see how it unfolded and what it is now, it's, it's incredible. So I'm just honored to be included with so many wonderful writers. And uh, tonight's just the start of a beautiful journey for this anthology and I'm truly excited and thankful. We're so glad you're, you're with us, Tony. Your poem is beautiful. I mean, not Tony. <laughs> Frankie. It's <just> a <laughs> pleasure to have you here from New York. And I remember what you put on my answer phone years ago. I still wish I had it. <laughs> So lots of chats, beautiful chats. Yeah. Maybe maybe I'll, I'll stop the recording. Yeah. Shall I? So, okay. So yeah. So. Again, a pleasure. I think I'm gonna have to save the chat so that I can savor it and read it again. Good idea. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. It was just I'm full <laughs> of the best kind of full. Thank you. <laughs>